David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Thursday. It's now March 4th, 2021. And of course, there's a little play on words to be had from that. And of course, that will remind you that it is the day that the latest, I guess the latest time that the QAnon crazies have come up with some expectation that something major is going to happen that will reverse the course of history. It is... Uh, the the inauguration day from ancient times, from before the uh, the change, the latest change in the Constitution in, in terms of uh, knocking inauguration back to January twentieth. I guess this was the original the original uh, date settled on for inaugurations back when you had to travel everywhere by horseback and they needed more time for transitions and. Uh, QAnon and other uh, Q-adjacent weirdos have convinced themselves that there was a secret reversion to the old constitution or that the new constitution was never valid in the first place. And so they'll all be uh, saved by the fact that uh, <clears throat> Donald Trump will be inaugurated uh, today, the actual constitutional inauguration day, and Joe Biden will be revealed to be either Donald Trump in a mask or a robot or uh, someone else in a mask that uh, who will be uh, arrested and executed when everything is set right. I mean, there are people out there, and, and several of them, I think it is just several, but uh, running around uh, uh, professing to truly believe that these things are going to happen. And, uh, well, you know, it's not something that you can just ignore entirely, as sometimes some of these weirdos have been building bombs in their basements, and you have to pay attention to what stupid things they say they might do today. And uh, the Capitol Police Force is, I guess this time, supposedly prepared for this possibility. I don't know that uh, I believe that much will come of it this time. I don't feel like there's been nearly as much uh, talking about and, and hype uh, for the date as there was for January 6th. How they missed the January 6th thing, I'll never know. Uh, we all watched in real time as social media exploded with expectations about exactly what happened on January 6th. Very few people should have been caught by surprise by the fact that many thousands of very weird people possibly motivated to do violence were going to show up at the Capitol that day. But this time around... Uh, I don't know. There are certainly some, but not nearly as many and not nearly as widely popular among the ranks of even the weird uh, for this thing. But uh, precautions are in place. Capitol Police, uh, I think on, let's see, what, what was the date of this article? I happen to have an NBC piece here. Police uncover possible plot, and that's in quotes, possible plot anyway, to breach the Capitol, U.S. House scraps Thursday session. So uh, votes that had been scheduled for today on the floor, I guess, have been uh, canceled and postponed, which not exactly a not a position you want to find yourself in. And I uh, certainly wish that uh, we were more secure in being able to say, uh, no, business as usual will go on and there will be no interruptions because of fringe weirdos. But I guess I suppose uh, at least for now, better safe than sorry. And maybe if the day can pass peacefully, then they can start talking about uh, changing the look of the fencing and razor wire that still surrounds the Capitol building to the chagrin of many uh, who work there and who live locally. And uh, it's just it's a bit of a black eye nationally to have to sit there and, and, and have this. But, uh, well, you know, you got to got to take these threats seriously until things begin to calm down. Uh, no help being given on that front by CBS News, which I happened to see this morning, uh, thanks to a tweet from Marcy Wheeler, uh, who picked up on this thing and retweeted it. I should grab this thing so I can include it in the roundup. <clears throat> CBS deciding to use its uh, valuable morning news time to interview the QAnon shaman guy, the uh, whose name is uh, something 
uh, less cool and slightly more embarrassing, uh, whatever his real name might be. I can't even remember. It doesn't matter. The idiot who showed up in the fur hat and then somehow, after getting arrested for his part in the insurrection, has convinced the federal government to uh, cater to his dietary needs for some reason while he sits in prison. And CBS interviews him uh, via, you know, I don't know, Skype or whatever. Uh, and uh, puts his splashes his face considerably less, you know, cool and audacious looking, I think, outside of the context of uh, the shirtless, tattooed, fur hat, face makeup look. Uh, he looks different as a prisoner, as he should, so I was glad for that context. Anyway, as long as Skype is working for CBS uh, and now working for us, we can turn to Greg Dworkin for his roundup of stories. We, there was a moment of panic there this morning when Skype wasn't working, but uh, they had the little uh, their their Connecticut team of internet gremlins uh, working on things and patched it up, and he's here. And good morning, Greg. How are you? Uh, I'm fine. They okay. replaced the hamsters, so uh, <laughs> you know we're, we're better now. A hamster. Uh, you know, it's it's. I I, I'm hoping that CBS will simply, instead of uh, actually interviewing this guy, will simply show the relevant section of Braveheart, and like, <laughs> who will know the difference? Sure, why not? Uh, no difference there. There's some guy to tear him apart at the and, end. You know, I'm okay. Okay, you know, face paint doesn't really matter. Uh, it's very popular. I mean, for four years, the president of the United States wore face paint every day. And no one looked twice. So uh, that's then we true. had a pandemic you know, because he didn't want to smear it. The uh, in your uh, uh, opening summary, in your cold open there, yeah, uh, pretty cool. The, the <laughs> idea that everything would be postponed because of the potential insurrection uh, today actually yes, uh, needs a corrective because oh, some things were speeded up. And so last night, ah, HR one, the. Uh, 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 election the reform act. bill yes. passed on a party line vote. It did. And uh, that'll go and back to the Senate. And as uh, Josh Marshall points out today, uh, you know, the Senate may kill it because uh, a lot of things go to the Senate to die if for a bill. Uh, nonetheless, it won't die quietly this time. All right. Because uh, there's so much attention to this that uh, people will, in, in fact, be uh, uh, pressured to do stuff. And this is where the fight over the filibuster really comes down. Hmm. So uh, we'll see how that goes. But uh, in the meantime, uh, a lot of new polling out today and yesterday. And let's start with uh, Navigator. Navigator survey has uh, information on the uh, uh, COVID relief bill, which, as you point out, should start any day now, depending upon uh, Ron Johnson. And there was uh, one very funny uh, obit of all things mm. oh. uh, that came to my attention about Ron Johnson. You know, people in the United States uh, have fairly strong opinions about things. So uh, Reed Wilson tweets that from a Madison, Wisconsin woman's obituary in lieu of flowers, please make a donation to Ron Johnson's opponent in 2022. <laughs> uh, okay. And uh, that's, that's a real it. obit, you know, not made up. So uh, I, I think that that's uh, important to, to point out in terms of some of the senators, like Rob Portman today railing about the fact that the COVID relief bill doesn't uh, have bipartisan support. That's ridiculous. All you have to do is vote for it and it has bipartisan support. Look senator. That. I mean, that's kind of one of the things you can do that we can't. Easy so that's uh, kind of silly. But uh, the Navigator points out it's very popular. Americans trust Biden and the Democrats over the GOP combating the coronavirus pandemic. Biden and the Dems, 56, GOP, 30, improving health care. Biden and the Dems, 53, GOP, 31, reopen schools. Biden, Dems, 47, GOP, 32, uh -huh. okay. uh, approval of the vaccine rollout. Approved now, 55 percent was 39 percent on February 1st. Disapproved 34 was 50 percent on February 1st. So there's a lot of optimism about what's going on here. And uh, which concerns you more? The federal government will not do enough. 62 percent. Federal government will do too much. 38. Who do you agree with more? Government needs to do more to help regular people. 64. Government needs to stay out of the way. 36. So mm -hmm. that's all good. Uh, and, of course, uh, there's even more polling than that. There's uh, Monmouth polling out today, uh, yesterday, Wednesday, March 3rd. Public wants stimulus checks more than GOP support for plan. Majority backs jobless benefits, wage hikes, some college debt relief. Uh, uh, $10,000 college debt relief is supported, 50, 
thousand, not so much. Okay. Now well, Biden's uh, uh, negative views have risen since uh, election. That's not surprising. He has a fifty-one percent job approval, down slightly from fifty-four. And the job rating for Congress is at thirty percent approve and fifty-nine percent disapprove, and thirty-four percent right direction, sixty-one percent wrong direction. Both ratings slightly better in January compared to now. So uh, the, the end of the honeymoon is coming. That's not surprising. But still, uh, Biden way more popular than his predecessor in that regard. And uh, th there's several different questions. What difference does popular opinion make in regard to passage? Well, for that question, you have to ask what difference does popular opinion make in regard to reelection? Because the job of the senators is to get themselves and their parties reelected. And uh, passing legislation is merely a tool to do that. And nobody should look at the Senate any differently than that. Oh, uh, why not? Sure, that's a fine explanation for it. I mean, uh, this is a piece by Trip Gabriel in happens. the New York Times. Yes. Republicans won blue collar votes. They're not offering much in return. Party you leaders know. want to capitalize on Donald Trump's appeal to the white working class. But in recent weeks, they've offered very little to advance working people's economic interests. Uh, and they talk about the old uh, Sam's Club conservatives and how they're trying to go after them. <laughs> okay. And they didn't take that opportunity at CPAC, and they're not doing much in regard to this particular bill. Now, Patrick Murray, the pollster for Monmouth, uh, makes the point that there's very little likelihood that Republicans will take a political hit for opposing this bill or any other mm -hmm. bill. So okay. long as it passes, oh. they would take a political hit if they blocked it. They'd get blamed. Well, but but yeah. if they rail against it, but don't block it, no problem, because uh, their constituents get the checks. Yeah. And they get the posture. Right. It's a perfect Ted Cruz situation. Uh, yeah. Right. I get the posture and everybody else does the work of helping my state. Hmm. OK. I mean, right. Yeah. And so in other words, looking for that. It, for you to get reelected or elected, but reelected in the sense that you're here doing stuff and people will judge you on that later. It's a necessary but not sufficient thing that you get stuff done. All right. Yes. But if you don't get stuff done, people will blame you. OK, that's easy. Fair. So it's the, 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 the game for the Republicans is let the Democrats govern and get stuff done and then blame them for it. But that will diffuse any political repercussions because those who vote Republican will vote Republican and they're not going to think about this. This pandemic is so big and the recovery need How is so is large that it uh, upends a lot of this stuff. But so long as the Democrats continue to govern uh, and get stuff done, they're actually shielding Republicans from the consequences of, mm. uh, of Republican recalcitrance. It's kind of a weird situation, but that's how things go. Okay. Uh, yeah, I get it. Uh, although, uh, well, uh, what can you do? There's not much you can do about it. I mean, you can't decide to give up governing uh, so that uh, maybe sort of kind of the, the political blame game shifts. That's not that's not the job you were hired for. Well, you know, you're, you were hired to get reelected again. So, you know, uh, well, yes. uh, not to be I, even too much so. cynical. Even, even but, if, it, but, if that was the job, it still doesn't. You, the you're not the question is, what is favors. it going to be to help you get reelected? Now, here's some interesting stuff that came out. And this is a piece from The Atlantic about Stockton, California. Uh, and I should preface this by saying we started to talk about the uh, minimum wage yesterday. And uh, listener Boswood pointed out that when I said uh, uh, my comments that the, the problem ah, with yes. increasing the minimum wage is that you're likely to increase uh, some degree of unemployment. Uh, but the bigger picture there that. is that there's trade-offs and you have to consider those trade-offs. He rightly pointed out that re more recent studies show that the uh, change in unemployment is actually going to be fairly minimal if you were to believe those studies. Not all studies show that, but the, a lot of the more recent ones do. But they argue about the degree of unemployment. Uh, those same studies argue that there are other trade-offs, in including uh, costing other people uh, who didn't get the minimum wage increase uh, increases in salary and so on and so forth. Uh, but the major point is, whatever you do, there's always trade-offs. It's not a Republican talking point to to consider those things. And yet, there's other things besides a minimum wage that would help people, such as a universal income or guaranteed jobs. Uh, and those are both important and part of the mix, but not quite the same thing. And this Atlantic piece 
is is about that. Annie Lowry wrote a piece on March 3rd, Stockton's basic income experiment pays off. Hmm. A new study of the city's program that sent cash to struggling individuals finds dramatic changes. And you may vaguely recall there was a Stockton mayor named Michael Tubbs uh, who went back to the community, uh, out of Stockton, back to Stockton, uh, and uh, did uh, some major things, some innovative work. Uh, He got private money and public money that was not Stockton's money, over $100 million. And he had three initiatives uh, that he uh, did with these. One was reducing gun violence. One was a guaranteed income for a certain number of people. And one was a $20 million college scholarship fund. Wow. And those initiatives didn't cost the taxpayers anything because he raised the money from outside. That's good. Okay. And as he left office, Stockton, uh, according to the Sacramento Bee, had a record number of police officers, an 18% drop in overall crime, and a $13 million budget surplus. A city that was once the largest in the nation to file for bankruptcy and had more murders per capita than Chicago was on the mend under Mayor Tubbs. All right. The most fiscally healthy municipalities in the nation, the Bee called them. Stockton was crowned an all-American city twice in four years. And Michael Tubbs was not reelected. Oh, Hey, you know, you can't have it all. That's, and that's the hard to believe. he wasn't reelected is because there was a major push on, uh, push on Facebook to uh, throw disinformation out. Oh, that seems unfair. Okay. In a city of approximately 310,000 residents, this Facebook site quickly grew to 120,000 followers, giving yes. them all sorts of uh, uh, bogus information. Uh, readers were told that $60 million a year my for homeless programs were given to Tubbs campaign donors. Wasn't true. Uh, and there was no homeless hub plan client plan for bringing people from the Bay Area to Stockton. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, the Facebook page uh, got more and more popular and people right. wound up voting against them because of the misinformation and disinformation. So uh, that's important in regard to looking at Republican senators and what sort of pressure, public pressure grows on the one hand, something can be incredibly popular and work really well. And on the other hand, that doesn't automatically translate to uh, what w- winds up happening in, in the vote. Hmm. And again, uh, Damn, this sucks. is uh, more of a broad theme that people don't base their votes on policy. They do base their votes on emotion. Wow. And so they you basically have to fire up voters one way or the other, either get them mad at you or get them to really like something mm. in order to get them out and get them to vote for you. And that's especially true when voting habits are already established. And that's why the Republicans feel safe, even though they know they're doing things that are relatively unpopular. Now, uh, past performance is no guarantee of future returns. And so just because in the past you were able to get away with this doesn't mean that in the face of an enormous crisis, that still holds. There are still plenty of examples of uh, conservative Republicans in places like Texas, for example, voting against Medicaid expansion ah, yes. and getting it uh, on uh, with that at the at the polls when it comes time for reelection. So those things still exist. Social Security is still probably a third rail and so on and so forth. Not all the uh, uh, election rules have been rewritten since. Uh, Donald Trump became president. But there's no question that, uh, again, as the New York Times uh, Trip Gabriel uh, article points out, on the one hand, you can uh, stiff your constituents when it comes to the economic anxiety they may or may not have. But the real reason that they voted for Trump had nothing to do with economic anxiety and had a great deal to do with uh, racism and cultural issues. So uh, Republicans are simply betting that they can double down on culture issues without Trump Mm -hmm. and still use that to win at the polls. And that's not at all clear. True. When we talked about Dave Shore's article yesterday, that was part of the deal that, uh, for example, defund the police and and crime works on uh, uh, certain constituencies, the uh, uh, Hillary to uh, Trump voter, for example. Um, And at the same time, it's not automatic that anybody other than Trump can pull that off. Yes, you know, Tom Cotton doesn't have the uh, 
fair to uh, say. The, the free-flowing personality to jump on the stage and uh, command the spotlight the way Trump did. That is and true. Uh, neither do his kids. Feel and they're sort true. of lean on experience. So uh, when you look at who's there after Trump, uh, not so clear. And if you're looking with Trump, the baggage doesn't necessarily translate to, okay, just because I did it in 2016, I could do it again. What he could do is what he did in 2020 and do that again, which is lose. And again, we talked awesome. about this before. Uh, the CPAC crowd, for example, uh, a third of them are ready to move on from Trump, and you can't win with those numbers. So again, looking at the overall picture here, the point is that what Biden is doing is incredibly popular. People approve of his performance. He's doing fine in that regard. Not perfect. There's plenty of things that could be adjusted. Uh, we have to make sure that people aren't left behind and so on and so forth. But that's the difficult job of governing. The easier job of getting reelected that the Republicans have is to allow Democrats to do this and then uh, at the same time pivot to uh, uh, working on their constituents' uh, uh, fears and uh, uh, racial anxiety. Uh, Newt Gingrich was uh, on Twitter the other day talking some nonsense about, uh, well, you know, the, the governors of Mississippi and Texas are dropping the mask mandate, but if there's a spike in coronavirus, it'll be because the immigrants are bringing disease with them when they come into those states. Ah, I see. Yes. You know, I mean, it's, it's pretty clear anybody, where they're going. Sure. This. You know, this isn't a, uh, a dog whistle or, uh, or read between the lines. This is a foghorn. <laughs> this is caravan stuff. And that's where they're going to go. It just be the dog itself. I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, we know what they might resort to. Uh, no point in... Uh, <laughs> in, in telling the truth about anything when you can get away with lies, I suppose. No research necessary. Right. So uh, this is a piece from uh, Politico uh, that happens to capture the moment. It's called New Mask Wars Threaten Biden's Pandemic Response at a Critical Moment. Okay. Here Biden is trying to be as nonpartisan as possible. You know, that's sure. his thing. That's his shtick. Okay. You know, that's his jam. And so... Okay. Uh, he tries to say, look, we'll help everybody. Texas has a snowstorm. We'll help you. And uh, in return, uh, Greg Abbott yes. says, OK, well, thank you very much. We're dropping the mass mandate because freedom. Right. And Mississippi does the same thing. And Biden yeah, says, you know, awesome. I've about had it with you guys. That's Neanderthal thinking. And you're going to screw everything up. <laughs> and so yeah. now we now we're back to, uh, you know, normal in regard I, to Republicans versus Democrats. I guess so. But the science says that there's actually reason to worry about uh, what's happening now, because especially the uh, South African variant uh, no. is uh, a little bit more uh, able to evade uh, the vaccines. And so Ooh. measures are going to need to be taken. Tony Fauci right. announced that there are some studies already getting set up to look at such things. Do you need a booster with the vaccine we have now? Do you need a, uh, a booster every year like the flu that changes when the, vac when the virus changes? Uh, is the virus becoming endemic? Are we uh, going to see flu seasons and, and uh, coronavirus seasons? Uh, and uh, do the mask and winter uh, approach need to be done every year? These are questions that are out there that we don't have the answer to. And in the midst of this, to simply drop the mask and say, OK, we're just going to open everything up is, as one senior administration official told Politico, crazy. Oh. Last thing we should be doing right now is putting down our guard. And that's especially true because the vaccine rollout is very impressive and happening very, very quickly. Biden promised 100 million vaccines in 100 days. It's actually going to be way more than that. Uh, really? and, and, you know, it's good to under-promise and over-deliver, as Ezra Klein was writing today in the New York Times. But, uh, you know, it's still going to take some time for all of that to happen. And uh, Biden's already moved up the date as, as to which uh, Americans can expect to be vaccinated by. And that's going to be at the end of May. And that's not that far off. It's already March. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, you can screw this up. And so some governors are working real hard to do that. Now, some things Good for you. like uh, outdoor stuff and beaches is yeah. not really the issue. You'll see spring break stuff and there'll be plenty of pictures of people partying at the beach and that's fine. It's when they go into the restaurants after they're at the beach that you have the most worry. And mm -hmm. so uh, those particular states, we're going to have to really watch very, very carefully. It's just that you can easily envision a, uh, a race 
between Kay Ivey of Alabama and uh, Greg Abbott in Texas and uh, Tate Reeve in Mississippi and Ron DeSantis in, uh, in Florida, not to say Christy Noem and some of the other Republican governor states racing mm-hmm. to see who could be the most free, which is to say put their population most at risk. We've already done this. We know what the outcome is. And so that's not a mystery. Uh, but, you know, there you have it. You know, some people just can't learn. Uh, I guess so. And, uh, well, I'll tell you the other interesting aspect of the uh, this resort to Neanderthal thinking is, uh, and equally predictable, the Internet and social media lighting up with, well, actually, Neanderthals weren't uh, any less intelligent than Cro-Magnon, man. Oh, okay, okay, okay. There aren't any Neanderthals around uh, to, to defend it at this point, but, uh, you know. Well, all right, we have to worry about that sort of thing, and uh, the, the, that's the the genius of social media is we also have to get caught up in that. But uh, all right, right. you know. Not so uh, we we have more on that. There's there are very more little on, that the that. federal government can do if states decide to do this. The federal government has control over borders, mm-hmm. and to a certain extent, a little bit of control over interstate issues, yes. but not much on intrastate issues. So from a legal point of view, not much they can do. One agency that can do something is OSHA, and so we'll get to that after the break. Okay. Yeah, well, uh, that might be helpful. Also, uh, some private uh, enterprise stepping up to help out a little bit anyway, some of the larger retail. Well, OSHA helps to regulate that, so that's where that comes in. Ah, okay. Well, no wonder. All right. I was wondering, well, why would these businesses be stepping up and saying we want, you know, we're going to continue to require our customers to wear masks? And uh, I guess it's a little more, a little more than just, well, we don't want all of our employees to get sick. I, I, they wouldn't start caring about employees now, I suppose. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Or read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. All right, welcome back now to the KGO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. We continue after our first break. Now we can go back to uh, what did OSHA do and when did they do it or something like that. What's the formulation of the question? Mask mandates being dropped in at least some kind of stupid states or states where they have kind of stupid governors. Uh, Neanderthal states. Right, yes. And uh, I think I, I think we can get away with saying that even though it's true that people are coming to the defense of Neanderthals. Uh I feel like yeah, we can I'm over do it. it though. I'm going to bully them. That's what's going to happen. I did it the first so, time. So uh, OSHA is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, yes. and it's an agency it's of the U.S. Department of Labor, uh, mm-hmm. just so people remember that. And Dave Michaels used to run it. David Michaels is an epidemiologist. He's the longest-serving OSHA head from 2009 through 2017. And uh, he had a uh, interesting thread that he uh, put out yesterday morning. No more mask mandates or density requirements in stores and other businesses in Texas and other states. Not so fast. OSHA, oh. which I ran for seven plus years, may get in the way. I OSHA ran. will issue a mandatory standard later this month that will likely conflict with actions by Abbott and some other governors to end virus exposure prevention efforts in businesses. Allow me to explain. Please. When OSHA issues a COVID-19 emergency temporary standard later this month, employers will be required to protect their workers. OSHA will likely require employers to conduct hazard assessments and make plans to protect workers from virus exhaled by coworkers or customers. Risk of exposure is increased by proximity and density. It's in, decreased by distance, mass ventilation, filtration, and a personal protective equipment, otherwise known as PPE. Yes. Generally, worker right. protection plans that ignore mass and density will not adequately protect the safety of workers or the public. And in developing and implementing OSHA-required plans, It'll be very difficult for businesses to justify ignoring CDC and OSHA guidance on worker and public protection measures. 
Okay. Businesses that care about their employees and customers should welcome mm. these standards since they can maintain mask and density requirements and protect workers, explaining that federal law requires them. The OSHA requirements will level the playing field. All businesses will have to follow the same rules, and those that want to do the right thing won't be inconvenienced or worse by anti-mask customers. The OSHA requirements will also reassure the many unvaccinated workers who are hesitant to return to unsafe workplaces fearful of getting infected. So the result, OSHA requirements will help slow the pandemic keep workers and the public healthy. In other words, government helping you. The biggest impact will be on retail establishments, no matter what Governor Abbott says. If Walmart, Target, Winn-Dixie, or other stores do not require masks, they risk an OSHA fine. So my advice to retailers and other businesses, don't throw away the mask must be worn signs. They're saving lives now, they'll save more lives tomorrow, and you're gonna need them when the OSHA standard is issued. And that's the end of his conversation. Now, the way things work, with uh, regulatory agencies, it's highly unlikely that the larger chains like Target and Walmart are unaware of this. Yes, no, They generally okay. work with the agencies before the actual formal guidelines come out. Hmm. And so one of the reasons that the uh, larger stores are saying not so fast, we're still going to require this is because they know this is coming. And there's no point in like dropping it for a week and a half and then, you know, coming back and doing it again. That just makes it worse. Yes. And uh, you'd have to pay for your signs all over again if you pull them down. Yeah, among other things. I mean, it's just, (laughs) you know, if it's coming, then just stick with what you're doing. And so that's uh, part of the reason why this is happening. And this is what happens when you have OSHA under Biden versus OSHA under Trump. Yeah. All right. Well, that is helpful uh, because, yes, I missed the intermediate step. And I did. I I saw news that uh, the large retailers were just saying, "Okay, well, we'll we'll continue to to require masks. Uh, but this makes much more sense, one, that they would know that OSHA's regulation is coming. And I guess unstated in all of this, but implicit in it, and uh, their corporate lawyers would have told them. Yeah, uh, if you find yourself saying uh, OSHA has no power over me, I still believe Trump is president and I'm going to drop the mask mandate and take my governor's word for it. Uh, when customers or employees sue you, and sitting out there in the open for all to see are federal government regulatory agency guidelines that say, no, you shouldn't drop this mandate. And uh, you'll be likely uh, to be found at fault if you do and employees or customers get sick. Exposing yourself to legal uh, liability is usually enough for companies to say, oh, I was interested in doing the right thing from the beginning. That's that's the reason I'm doing it. Because I love doing right. You know, okay, whatever your excuse is, just so long as you do it. Right. Okay. Now, getting back to our discussion about uh, whether uh, the GOP pays a price or doesn't pay a price, this is an interesting uh, thread by Will Stansel, uh, uh, who does uh, Metro Policy Research, uh, and he's uh, most interested in things like uh, fair housing, just a very uh, politically active guy. And he writes, uh, in regard to this whole David Shore interview about uh, uh, more conservative people of color compared to liberal whites, and uh, basically you have to uh, structure your, uh, if you're a Democrat, program Mm -hmm. around what the more conservative elements of your party want because it's people of color uh, conservatives who make up voters that you cannot afford to lose. In effect, that's what he's saying. All right. Uh, and what Will Stansel writes is, here's what the GOP gets that Democrats really, truly struggle with. Politics is about way more than policy. Politics is not about voters saying, which policy platform do I prefer? It's about making cultural, emotional, and factional appeals. The problem okay. is that moderate liberals and centrist Democrats typically have two responses to this. The first is to say, well, that just means we have to redouble efforts and do things that are even more popular. We are just talking about the COVID relief mm, bill, for example. Right. But it still doesn't work because that's not what politics is about. Shoot. The second is to say, well, we have to appeal to the cheap seats. We have to start punching some hippies. Talk about cancel culture. Mm. And he, he writes, Matt Iglesias has been on this train. It sounds smart to older white dudes because they personally like punching hippies. Sure. Or having others do it. Right. You know, or, or having blogger ethics conferences. Mm. Oh, yeah. Right. You know. I forgot about those. Right. So the problem with this approach is that you're not making good cultural, emotional, factional appeals. You're just mimicking the GOP. And in doing so, you're also opening fire within your own coalition at some of your most loyal voters. And we need those people. 
So it's actually easier to envision a democratic politics based around mocking environmentalists and wokeism somewhere like New York City, where you have plenty of voters to spare, than it is in a purple state. We're making war on younger progressives is a potentially fatal mistake. Hmm. So, uh, you know, be careful about doing it in Georgia, for example. Interesting. You can't I afford, to, you can't afford to lose any voters in Georgia. Like New York City, too. you know. Uh, that, that, that's why it's always funny that, uh, you know, you Democrats never uh, take on Andrew Cuomo. You always support him. Well, actually, most of the progressive really can't stand Andrew Cuomo. Uh, that's true. The thing is that if he leaves, you're likely to elect a Democratic governor and if he stays you're likely to elect the democratic governor i see so big difference there you know it's not uh, a purple state the solution here is actually will writes not all that complicated it's to try to build a set of rhetorical and cultural and emotive appeals that can rival the gops what does that look like it can look like a lot of things there's no one algorithmically correct politics pugilism is good for that but it's best directed at the other guy not your own base hmm Okay. Sherrod Brown and John Fetterman are good in, at, good at that. They, they they fight with Republicans, right? Yeah. Not with Joe Manchin. Uh, yes, for the most part. Well, certainly Sherrod Brown doesn't. Uh, yeah. I mean, I know what Fetterman does do. I haven't. I don't know. Yeah. I guess I don't know offhand. I don't know that fighting with Sherrod Brown wins. So I suppose that's Sherrod really. Brown doesn't fight with Joe Manchin. Hmm. Hello. Yeah. That's not really the major We're issue in the here. Same fight with the Republicans. And this is actually a pretty traditionalist view of politics, that good politicians go out there and excite people with positive and negative emotions and reframe how they think and use that excitement to build support. History shows there are many ways to do it, but it's not a view of politics. It's easily reducible to a bunch of numerical analysis. Here he's picking on David Shore, who's a numerical anal analyst. Oh, I see. FDR was an a epochal political figure in way his predecessor wasn't, his rhetoric and personality have echoed through decades. And why? Well, a statistician would struggle to tell you. Oh. One problem we have is we've outsourced all our top tier political analysis to a bunch of guys who are essentially versions of Nate Silver, people who have a statistical hammer and want to find statistical nails to explain everything with. And that's blinded us to the infinite possibilities for creative political rhetoric and coalition building you see, all you liberal arts people out there, we need you. You can't leave it all to the engineers. You got mm. that? Okay. And to the vital, indispensable role of think I'm an engineer, to like <laughs> leadership and moral clarity and celebrity, we end carefully managing party positions and policy proposals to try to get electoral results because it's the only lever susceptible to our analysis. It's the only one we ever pull. Mm. And it never occurs to us that maybe it's not really hooked up to as much as we think. Again, a fancy way of saying it's necessary but not sufficient to do popular things. You also have to make people feel good about what you did or bad about what the other guy wants to do. All right. Right. One other thing, finding good politics is often a process of instinct and trial and error. There's no way to figure out with polls in advance what's going to work. Polls are good at predicting elections because elections are simple and a poll can perfectly reflect the choice in a ballot booth. But politics more broadly, isn't like that. You can't poll what somebody would feel about an issue or a politician if the cultural context shifts. Trump himself is the best example of this. Pretty much anybody who could read a poll expected his politics to be a huge disaster for the GOP. It wasn't. It hurt in some ways, but worked out well in others. Under Trump, a lot of Republicans ended up fanatically supporting stuff it's hard to imagine they would have said they supported in advance. His demagogic uh, politics transform the whole environment in hard to foresee ways. When somebody says, what should Democrats do with to win more elections? Anybody who claims to know for sure is either deluded or lying. There's lots of theories and we should probably try lots of them out and see what works. But here's what we shouldn't do. Sit around with a bunch of spreadsheets and try to figure out the pitch perfect policy platform. Hmm. Real political success is proven on the field, not in the lab. Human beings have a knack for this to so promote good leaders and let them do their thing. Uh, and I would, oh, and by the way, regulate Facebook. <laughs> No, oh, yeah. She stopped him. Yes, right. I was really surprised by that. I mean, not surprised that Facebook could do that, but that, that it happened, you know, on such a low. It happened level. under our nose. And it, like, yeah. We didn't really spend a whole lot of time talking about it. What was the time frame of that, by the way? I was skimmed through the article and I didn't see any dates jump out at me, but when was he? Uh, uh, do you know offhand? I don't. And uh, uh, Well, yeah, this is a January 2021 article. I think it was the last yeah. election. Oh, okay. I just like had to, I, I, I guess we didn't notice it because it was 
local election in Stockton, and there was this other national election we were all paying attention to. But oh, here, uh, right up at the top, two years ago. Uh, okay, so two years ago they did this stuff, uh, this remarkable stuff, and I guess uh, in order to have done that under this mayor and then have the end of the story be he hasn't been reelected, I guess it must have been the last election. Wow. All right. Well, we were distracted, but what a story! I thought, uh, you know, briefly afterwards, like, oh, what, what if this happened yeah. in two thousand fourteen, two thousand twelve, and we didn't notice? But. We it happened last year and we didn't notice. So okay. Uh it may have been 2018. I have to it check the date be. on that. But it was either twenty eighteen or twenty twenty. Certainly recent. Um Yeah, I, I guess I, so. If it's I, a you new know, article it, it's two something years that ago, one, you know, needs to be aware of. And uh there's very uh good reason to uh talk about uh uh regulating Facebook and, and what uh the Congress is doing in terms of interviewing them and grilling them and so on and so forth. There's a lot of reasons why politicians need to be worried about this. Yeah, I, I think so. This is just one. There are many. Okay. Yeah. So wow. yeah, it looks like 2020 so from surprising. what I can tell. He's talking about Mike Bloomberg and getting his endorsement and so on and so forth. <laughs> that didn't work. Can't believe well, it. Well, you know, again, uh, we ban him. he's trying to raise money for his town. Yeah. Uh, right. So where are you going to go? You're going to go where the money is and uh, that'll bring you in contact money. with Bloomberg. And Why Willie Sutton robs banks? Because that's where the money is. Yeah. Well, for a while that made sense. Now, I don't know. Internet. Rob the internet, I guess, somehow. Okay. Uh, interesting. Anyway, all food for thought. You know, one has to put all of this in perspective. There's no reason not to do popular things. But, and you should be aware yeah. when you're doing something that's very unpopular. The thing is that Democrats, and again, this is a point David Shore made that I think is right about, not so much about what Democrats should do, but making the point that Democrats have very small margins for various and sundry reasons, whether it's gerrymandering or the uh, electoral college uh, advantage that uh, red states have when it mm -hmm. comes to senators. Uh, there's a smaller margin for Democrats to work with just like what's going on in the Senate right now. Yes. And so you got to do what you got to do to preserve those margins and grow those margins. And that means fighting with Republicans and not Joe Manchin, no matter how annoyed or uh, no matter how, how bad you think this is. And trying to put pressure on cinema and Manchin to follow along with you is not going to work. Mm, well, right. The, the way to, the way to get cinema and Manchin is to add more people so that they don't matter as much. Oh, well, yes, that would be, that's one way. You can't do that them. until the next election. Yeah, true. I mean, I don't know. In the meantime, I guess you could try to, well, depending on what you mean by pressure them. I mean, beating them over the head uh, consistently, probably not all that helpful as opposed to, well, you know, maybe we can find some way to make the stakes of this ele of, of this uh, bill or the uh, the outcome being determined by the filibuster make make it matter to them such that right. they find an excuse to say i'm not changing my mind about the filibuster i simply am voting to do this thing which all right so i got a procedural question for you uh, now all right uh and for those of you playing along at home i didn't tell them in advance because like we don't talk about how to do this show in advance we should but mm -hmm. uh uh, you know, I give them test. five minutes notice of what I'm, I'm talking about, except now when I don't even give them that. Right. Okay. So this is, is the tentative schedule for today in the Senate, according to uh, Senate. congressional okay. reporter Daniel Reed. And that hide from okay. insurrectionists. Okay. Tentative schedule. No, uh, just like in the in the anthrax uh, attacks back in 2001, the I House see. disappeared, the Senate stayed. All right. Well, there's more of them, so. It's harder to yeah, keep well, you know, that, that, that way the Senate can make fun of the House. That's like a traditional thing. I guess so, so the tentative schedule of today in the Senate, 30 yes. to 40 minutes procedural vote to consider the bill, 10 hours of reading the bill. <laughs> yes, right. And right. some funny stories about that. Mm -hmm. It's six to 700 pages, and that was requested by Ron Johnson. Yes. He likes okay. reading. And in, <laughs> in past years, uh, people have gotten around this in various and sundry ways. Uh, one year with Henry Waxman chairing a committee, they brought in a speed in reader. Right. Yes. A lot and of, it was uh, a very, very funny uh, uh, situation with with the guy speed reading the bill. 
And uh, after laughing at it, uh, even the the uh, GOP said, I just want to hear this guy do this, and then I'll suspend my request to have the bill read. Yeah. So let's just do this. And you know, for like five minutes, he sped read the bill. It was really very funny. And then uh, I forget who the uh, Republican uh, ranking member was with Waxman chairing, said, okay, now I want you to do it in a Texas accent. So the guy <laughs> did. Yeah, he did. Uh, by the way, the ranking member was uh, Filthy Joe Barton. And, uh, oh, okay. and he's gone now. <laughs> Right. I in Florida, they did it with an auto reader. Oh, like one of these robocall things. Very interesting. Right. And then another way. Can you get one that sounds like Stephen Hawking? Yeah. And another way is demanding that this happen is that uh, uh, a couple of people are assigned from the Democratic side to stay on the floor. Mm -hmm. And whenever a Republican gets up and goes to the bathroom, they say, OK, we want to call a uh, call the question yeah. as to whether we can stop this making them run back from the bathroom uh, because it's a 50-50 Senate. And so, uh, you know, there's a number of different ways that you could uh, screw up Ron Johnson's plan. But in any case, 10 hours of reading the bill, uh, which can be shorter than 10 hours, then 20 hours of debate. Reader, right. That's time. And then the Voterama, which Rand Paul says he wants to last for infinity. That's the part I'm asking oh, me you too. about. What does he mean? Uh, he, well, uh, He's just going to come up with as many uh, amendments as he can and insist on votes on them. The, the, the debate time is limited by statute, but all legit amendments that are recognized by the chair have to be voted on. And so uh, the, the, the voterama is what evolves out of that. That is, uh, you're out of debate time, but you have pending amendments. And so basically you just vote uh, take one minute to introduce a brand new amendment and vote on that one and then another and another and another. And theoretically, but aren't there ways for the chair or the majority to get around that filling the tree or whatever that's called? Uh, yes, although that was one of the things that uh, Schumer promised not to do, although, you know, maybe under these circumstances he gets away with doing it. There was also just plain eventually. I mean, I guess if you really tried to make it go on forever Eventually, the chair could just say, all right, these aren't real amendments. They're just not. This is dilatory, and I'm ruling it out of order. I just don't recognize you for the purpose of offering an amendment. Sorry. And so, fight you know, according to the schedule, the way vote. I'm just uh, doing my yeah. uh, back of the envelope favoring, sometime between Friday and Sunday, they're going to vote on this thing. Uh, yeah, very likely. That's uh, it's about as long as those things tend to go. I, but, uh, yeah, you, you can, in theory, and only in theory, stretch them out forever until at some point uh, even the most inventive obstructionist is no longer able to come up with amendments that his colleagues will uh, defend as substantive and 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 uh, serious so yeah but uh, they can stretch it out for quite a while and uh, into the weekend would not be uh, impossible to do but, but I don't think it's going to go past the weekend. I doubt it. Um, if they can come up with amendments and, uh, you know, it's a difficult thing to get uh, your entire conference, in the case of the Republicans, to hang around wasting time when they know it's a waste of time, when it's being billed as a waste of time. They don't like to do well, it. They speaking, prefer to rely on regular filibusters. Speaking of wastes of time. Okay. On the other side... Yes. Of the building. Um, in the house. In the house. Marjorie Taylor Greene oh, yeah. every morning uh, wants to. Uh, she holds. What does she do? Adjourn the, adjourn the house. Yes. I mean, she's doing this every day and getting her own That's people really pissed off. What's that about? <laughs> uh, she's got What's the nothing procedural else to thing do? she's trying to do. She is trying to adjourn the house so that they cannot do any work. Uh, she, she offers a motion to adjourn, which is a, uh, still considered a privileged motion because I, I don't know why exactly, but uh, it's the sort of thing that is very basic to the functioning of the House. So uh, it's easily defeated, you know, so long as you have a majority. She moves to adjourn. The majority says, all right, no. She calls for a vote. They have the vote. They don't adjourn. And then she's out of tricks. I, I don't know where she learned this one. Or somebody just handed her the slip and said, if you really feel like pissing people off because you're angry about losing your committee assignments, do this every morning. 
So she's doing it. They might come up with another one. There aren't that many things that you can uh, call up as a rank and file member and trigger a vote with in the House. But that's one of them. So uh, apparently that's her plan every day to move to adjourn. If 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 for some reason she were to prevail, she would prevent the House from working on whatever bill they were thinking of doing that day. And she's doubtless opposed to all of them. But the problem is that she's a member of the minority and you can't do very much. So in essence, what she's saying is I have lost my ability to work on committees. And so therefore, I am going to make you all vote every day on my motion to not do any work at all, any of you. So, all right, fine. And but that'll cast her paychecks. Now, yep. for those of you following at home, by the way, as a, as a side note, uh, there is this uh, New York City method of speech called cooperative overlapping, in, <laughs> in which, in effect, you interrupt each other because that's the way conversation goes. But you'll notice whenever David is talking about procedure, that's privileged communication. Ah, <laughs> I really yes. don't interrupt them that much. I just that listen. That does usually happen that way, doesn't it? Okay. Now I know the secret of it. Yeah. Uh, yep. So whenever okay. you want me, you know, you don't have to invoke cloture on me to get me to shut up. Just say, listen, I have a procedural point to make. And then, you know, <laughs> like I stop and you get to talk. On the other hand, I do have this message here that says uh, from our friend Ride the Curve, who says, now I miss the dryer. <laughs> turn, turn that machine back on. <laughs> Abby, come in here. Can you bark, please? All right. Do something. Okay. Oh, here she comes. She's standing right here. So, Very good. So oh, she'll you bark for you and just bring things back to normal. Very good. Uh, uh, hey, the uh, the garbage guys are outside. It's not working yeah, for that's me. Wednesday. I can't tell. That's Wednesdays. Yeah. I know. You know. All yeah. right. We we had a discussion with the uh, environmental engineers in the home, and uh, the dryer won't be going during the uh, show, <laughs> or I will remember to close the door, whichever comes first. Okay. But uh, anyway, that's my segment for today. I tried to edit See, that. an, an hour's worth work. of stuff to talk about. Yeah. Okay. Very good. We'll follow up on all of that. Plenty to uh, check in on, and uh, some of it is procedural, some of it not. But all right. I think we've got it, and that's good news. Thanks, Greg. I appreciate it. And uh, I don't know. I guess you can, if you feel like it, you can hang around until the uh, break comes and and, and uh, hang up. Then I know you like to see if you can exit silently without making the, the noise, but yeah, it's, well, it's fine. We'll, we'll see if we can do that. <laughs> okay, ready? Take care, and I'll talk to you uh, sometime, maybe Monday. All right. Oh, let's, okay. Very good. We'll do that, and I can probably edit out the noise if you're worried about it. Yep. All right. Let's see. Uh, one of the things that I have been meaning to discuss on the air that is procedural, I, I pointed everybody to the article yesterday. We'll definitely make some room for it in the next segment. But uh, Norm Ornstein has taken on the question of, all right, well, what do you do about your Joe Manchins and Kirsten Cinemas? And his conclusion came in the form of his uh, op-ed, I suppose. I don't know. Norm Ornstein, I guess, gets a column when he demands one. Uh, Democrats can't kill the filibuster, but they can gut it. Three reforms that Manchin and Cinema might consider. Uh, and why don't we, we can just take it right into the break by reading through some of it and save the further discussion and the notes on it until afterwards. Uh, but here's what he has to say. Democrats, of course, you know, won both Georgia Senate seats in the January runoffs, giving them control, and we might put that in scare quotes, control of both houses of Congress and the White House for the first time in a decade, but their ability to advance legislation from raising the federal minimum wage to democracy reforms in the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, still to come, I think, can be thwarted by the Senate's 60-vote supermajority filibuster rule, which we all remember isn't really a rule anyway. Progressives' anger at Minority Leader Mitch McConnell and his caucus, which is actually a conference, who use the filibuster to block every initiative they can, is nearly matched by their frustration with Democratic Senators Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema. And, uh, you know, uh, judgment call as to how you spend your time raging about it, as we pointed out earlier. Anyway, their opposition to getting rid of the filibuster means Democrats are stuck with it since they'll need all 50 votes in their caucus, plus Vice President Harris as a tiebreaker to do it. Last month, the progressive No Excuses PAC, whose leaders helped elect Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in 2018, said Manchin and Cinema stand in the way of progress by abetting Republican efforts to shrink their own party's pandemic relief, 
climate and economic investment plans and uh, everything else along the way, including uh, H.R. 1 as a possibility. The Political Action Committee has talked up primary challenges to both of them to show, quote, how angry Democratic primary voters are going to be, unquote, if they continue to support the filibuster. Manchin hasn't budged, though, so I guess it's not working. Monday, when asked if he'd reconsider his stance on eliminating the filibuster, he shot back, Jesus Christ, what don't you understand about never? Uh, Okay. Of course, you know, there's a lot that we don't understand about why you say never, but okay. Never I understand. It's just a question of can I change the circumstances on the ground? So Democrats are right to see the urgency. Republican state lawmakers around the country are moving to enact voter suppression measures that will, if passed, put the slender Democratic majorities in the House and Senate uh, in jeopardy in 2022 and beyond. Without democracy reform and with the Supreme Court's recent assaults on the Voting Rights Act, sticking with the filibuster could make it nearly impossible for the Biden administration to pursue its agenda. But Democrats should proceed with caution. And here will take us into the break. I think I warned, that's Norm saying this, uh, that if Republicans harangued Senator Jim Jeffords, remember him, uh, independent eventually from Vermont, if they harangued him over his apostasy on their party's policy priorities back when they had them, they would regret it. He would switch parties and in a 50-50 Senate, shift the Senate majority. The next month, that happened. That exact scenario played itself out. The same concern now applies to Democrats with Manchin. Push too far and the result could be majority leader McConnell once again, foreclosing Democrats' avenue to pursue infrastructure, tax reform, and health reform legislation. So what can Democrats do? That comes up after the break. All right, welcome back now to the Cake Run in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Ah, a little trouble with the uh, mute button. And uh, who knows what? Uh, the onset of spring. The two, uh, the confluence, dangerous for radio broadcasting. Okay, so, all right. Uh, Norm Ornstein, I think uh, maybe a little more nervous about uh, the possibilities of party switches, either by Manchin or, or I guess... I guess cinema, although well, she's not mentioned in that context, uh, then I think is really warranted. I don't think the uh, likelihood of a, I don't think there's much likelihood of a party switch, but I, I wouldn't want to tempt fate. In West Virginia, it would be a close call. This could possibly happen. Um, and I suppose if you're pushing him to the point of saying, Jesus Christ, what do you not understand about never? Uh, then maybe, all right, uh, it's certainly a signal that you might need to back off somewhat. So anyway, uh, let's get to the bigger point. What can Democrats do that might be effective in pursuing their agenda, doesn't piss off Manchin such that he decides to at least consider switching parties or punishing people in whatever form that might take, uh, but uh, might also get him to cast his vote in ways that uh, they're very much needed, but without putting him in a position of having to explain a change of heart on reforming the filibuster. There are a few things. And let's see what Norm has to say about it. For a West Virginia Democrat, heavy criticism from key members of his own party, up to and including President Biden, might wind up working to Manchin's advantage. That was true of an earlier apostate, uh, Richard Shelby, Senator Shelby of Alabama, who's been reelected several times after switching from Democrat to Republican in 1994. I remember that happening after butting heads with President Bill Clinton. Anyway, uh, now out of the historical context and into the modern. Instead of naming and shaming them, Democrats might consider looking at what Manchin and Cinema like about the filibuster. They might consider, but I, well, I will say this cinema. Uh, well, actually both of them um, really actually are pretty nonsensical about what they say they like about the filibuster. I mean, I think they're just wrong about the dynamics of it, but that's what they say they like. But if they say, you know, if, if this plan is let's see what they say they like and then find some way to accommodate them, then you're accommodating nonsense, but okay. 
you might be stuck doing that. Anyway, let, let's get back to the article and uh, let him express himself uh, more clearly rather than interrupting Norm Ornstein all the time. All right. So Democrats might consider looking at what Manchin and Cinema like about the filibuster. Cinema recently said, quote, ready? Retaining the legislative filibuster is not meant to impede the things we want to get done. Even though that's what's happening. Rather, it's meant to protect what the Senate was designed to be. Though it isn't. Okay. I believe the Senate has a responsibility to put politics aside and fully consider, debate, and reach compromise on legislative issues that will affect all Americans. Again, I guess I I can't help it. I can't not let that. I can't just let it go and not comment on it. It's not Norm Ornstein though. Here, he's just recounting what Kristen Cinema, Kirsten Cinema said. Um, that's hilarious. <laughs> I don't know. What to say. I mean, that's just. I don't know what planet you think the Senate is on, but okay. You know. Oh, I, I think it's our responsibility to put politics aside and work on solutions. Well, duh. I mean, sure, everyone wishes that was what the Senate was about. And maybe you have the impression that it was once about that, but you were in diapers when it was. So, you know, who cares? It's just not what the Senate is about now. And nobody puts politics aside. It's not done. And it was never done then either. But uh, this, I mean, right. It's amazing that they uh, uh, would then go and accuse, for instance, uh, I think, most progressives of being, well, you're you're asking for this and that and the other thing. It's all just pie in the sky. You, if wishes were horses, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I mean, what do you make of this? Right? Well, if everybody would just put politics aside and work with me to get real solutions that help America. Oh, what, what does that mean? Nothing. Do something. All right. Anyway, last year, Manchin said this, the minority should have input. That's the whole purpose for the Senate. If you basically do away with the filibuster altogether for legislation, you won't have the Senate. You're a glorified House, and I will not do that. I don't know what's wrong with glorifying the House, but okay. And I don't know why you think you're glorified just because you're the Senate. I mean, maybe you're a worse House. I mean, we don't want to create something worse, but I mean, what makes you think you'll automatically be glorified anyway? But yeah, this too is highly questionable uh, his whole premise, Manchin's whole premise for keeping the filibuster is, well, it forces compromise. But, I mean, there's really not that much, you know, <laughs> in favor of that argument, quite honestly. During the show yesterday, something was happening. We were, there was a, a tweet circulating, um, and I can't recall exactly what the wording of it is now. I wonder if I could scroll back and find it. But I think I was just retweeting somebody else's comment about uh, things and then, you know, just adding a, a note of my own. Let's see. It's probably a little further back. Oh, and it reminds me. And now I see a whole bunch of other stories that uh, in the Twitter feed that we m might decide to get to later on. Where is this thing? Uh, no, a little further back. Um, but I, it did happen, I think, during yesterday's show. But uh, it had to do with nominations, actually. And that nominations, ah, here, here we go. Uh, was it, uh, yeah, maybe Adam Gentleson's comment? Where's my own comment on it, too? Uh, but uh, hmm. let me go back in the chain here. Here we are. Uh, oh, no, okay. It began with Sahil Kapoor, his uh, the NBC News reporter, commenting that Biden's filibuster position hasn't changed. I, I guess uh, discussing the fact that Biden himself isn't uh, uh, calling for the elimination of the filibuster just yet. Although uh, historically, Biden's filibuster position has changed. Uh, that's just a, a fact. But I guess in the current context, his position hasn't changed. That according to White House officials who point Sahil uh, to broad support for his nominations as a sign of cooperation. That is that Republicans haven't, for the most part, killed many of his nominations for executive branch positions, cabinet positions, etc. And so that's taken as a sign that Republicans are willing to cooperate. And so therefore, 
we are not at the point where we need to kill the filibuster because they're simply being intransigent and unreasonable. So therefore, no reason for a change in your position on the filibuster. Uh, some Dems, he goes on to say, say his overtures will only waste time as Republicans run the Obama era playbook of unifying to weaken the president. OK, so there are certainly push there's pushback from Senate Democrats who say this is a game. Republicans are going along with some of your nominations. That doesn't really mean anything in terms of policy. And you're going to end up uh, suckered into the idea that you could pursue them to get bipartisan support, even if it's only one or two Republicans that support your proposals. And I know that's a that's a feather in your cap, but they intend to string you along and you're going to waste valuable time chasing something that's never going to materialize. But, yeah, all right, well, whatever. More to the point, though, I think, for my purposes, is the first part of the comment. Biden's filibuster position hasn't changed, uh, per White House official who points me to broad support for his nominations as a sign of cooperation. And I thought it was worthwhile pointing out at this juncture that, well, you know, uh, how good of a sign is it in terms of uh, real uh, cooperative intent from Republicans? I mean, remember filibusters have been eliminated on executive branch nominations and now on all judicial nominations as well. You can't filibuster on nominations. So the sign that they haven't been obstructionist over most of your nominations isn't really a sign of either their uh, enduring commitment to cooperation or their forbearance on the filibuster. It's just not available to them. And so uh, it doesn't really tell you all that much. I mean, uh, you're not getting a lot of cooperation from the Rand Pauls and Mike Lees and Tom Cottons and Josh Hawley's of the world. Uh, you're just, but you are getting no votes instead of votes against cloture that, you know, would uh, maintain a filibuster in place and block the nomination from going through. But they're doing all that they can to delay and to deny you as much bipartisan support for your nominations as possible. So they're really not taking my, I don't take much out of that. Um, and as uh, Joe Sudby uh, points out in response to my own comment here, if nominations are a sign of cooperation and they can't be filibustered, then the White House is actually reinforcing Adam Gentleson's point that the filibuster inhibits bipartisanship instead of Joe Manchin's old, you know, I just would say hoary old uh, uh, conventional wisdom that the filibuster requires bipartisan cooperation. And, you know, I mean, it made a certain amount of sense at one point on a on a common sense level. Well, if everything requires bipartisan support in order for anything to pass because of the filibuster, then the filibuster forces bipartisan cooperation in order to get anything done. The, the, the part that Joe Manchin is leaving out is the in order to get anything done. Like you could very well see entire Congresses pass where the rule basically is, all right, pretty much nothing is going to get done. Very little of substance is going to change. And that's an, that's an inherently conservative tool. Many people have pointed that out. Um, so why would you perpetuate it unless uh, you misunderstand what the situation really is? Or very little needs to get done in order to satisfy you that you've done your work. Anyway, let's uh, jump back to uh, Norm Ornstein here and finish this up. Uh, my critique of those comments now being over. If you take their views at face value, Manchin and Cinema, and you, you shouldn't. The goal is to preserve some rights for the Senate minority with the aim of fostering compromise. Okay, well, they're wrong, but they're not going to give up their votes. So what do we do? The key, then, is to find ways not to eliminate the filibuster on legislation, but to reform it to fit that vision, and here are some options. And you might as well consider them because uh, as wrong as they are, they're not likely to 
admit it or confront it. So how do you work around it? And here's where Norm can help us out. One, make the minority do the work. Currently, it takes 60 senators to reach cloture, to end debate, and to move to a vote on final passage of a bill. The burden is on the majority. This is, I think, a mistake. I mean, he's right about it, but I think it's a mistake and it's an accident of history. The burden is on the majority, a consequence of filibuster reform in 1975, which moved the standard from two-thirds of senators present and voting, in order to invoke cloture, I add, as a clarifying note, uh, and changed that to three-fifths of the entire Senate. I think you've heard me uh, discuss it the old standard anyway, just to clarify, because I mangled the sentence here, used to be pre-1975, in order to invoke cloture on anything, you had to get a two-thirds vote of the Senate, but they counted two-thirds in a different way. It was two-thirds of whoever happens to be there at the moment and shows up to vote, you know, even if you stretch the vote out for an hour. They got to show up and, and do something about it in order to be counted here. Whereas the new standard, and we can discuss, and I have discussed it in the past, and one day we could do a whole show, or just a 20-minute segment on why did it come down this way, but they reduced it from two-thirds to three-fifths, that is, in a full Senate with everybody voting from 67 down to 60 votes. But again, they changed the way those votes were counted. Instead of a straight up two thirds vote. And, you know, if everybody shows up, fine. 67 votes are necessary. But if fewer than uh, all 100 senators show up, it's two thirds of whatever the vote count is, you know, and you got to do the calculations every time. The, the new rule ended up being three fifths, which could be as many as 60, but could be less if it was the same method of counting. Three fifths of those present and voting, but it isn't. And I think it was very intentionally done uh, by uh, the those opposed to the reform. The original proposition was, yeah, it'll just be three fifths of those present and voting. But those opposed to reforming the filibuster said, how about if it's three fifths of all senators duly chosen and sworn? That would mean, in other words, that you had to have an affirmative 60 in favor of cloture, uh, even if none of those opposed to cloture bothered to show up, right? So if you owed only 59 votes in favor of cloture and all of those opposing cloture went to Cancun <laughs> instead of showing up to vote, 50, the vote could be 59 to zero in favor of cloture and you still lose. That's the upshot of it. I think you're all aware of that. So anyway, uh, the problem here, of course, is that uh, before that change, if the Senate went around the clock, filibustering senators would have to be present in force. If, for example, only 75 senators showed up for a cloture vote and 50 of them uh, were in favor of cloture, they could invoke cloture and move to a final vote. So you could do it with 50 votes in, instead of the 67 you needed if the circumstances were right. After the reform, only a few senators in the minority needed to be present to request unanimous consent uh, or for any to, to I guess, uh, oppose any request for unanimous consent and keep the majority from closing debate by forcing a quorum call. Around the clock, the around the clock pro approach riveted the public, putting a genuine spotlight on issues. Without it, the minority's delaying tactics go largely unnoticed with little or no penalty for obstruction and no requirement actually to debate the issue. In other words, what became known as the silent or painless filibuster. Uh, nobody has to hold the floor and talk. You just have to be able to have a objecting senator show up to uh, object to any unanimous consent requests to end debate. And so long as you can keep 40 on your side, whether they show up or not, if you can deny 60, or I guess 41, if you can deny 60 to the side that wants cloture, then there's really nothing that they can do about it. And you don't have to invest yourself in the filibuster anymore. It's up to the majority to try to find a way around it rather than the minority to exert their rights. If it's about minority rights in all of this as, uh, as Manchin likes to claim, well, 
With rights come responsibilities. If they will do the work, they can have the delay. But there's no reason that we should do the work for them and allow them to skip town while the delay continues. One way to restore the filibuster's original intent, Ornstein continues, would be requiring at least two-fifths of the full Senate, or 40 senators, to keep debating instead of requiring 60 votes to end debate. The burden wouldn't fall to the minority, who would have to be prepared for several votes, potentially over several days and nights, including weekends and all-night sessions, and if only once they couldn't muster 40, the equivalent of cloture, debate would end, making way for a vote on final passage of the bill in question. Certainly something I've considered in the past when, uh, after pushing for elimination of the filibuster, beginning in oh, about 2009 or so, um, it became obvious that there weren't enough Democrats on board with the concept. And so, you know, we began looking for some solutions that, uh, well, so very much in the same vein, although I will say at that point we were accommodating senators who were much less annoying than Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema. So I did a little bit more work and was happy to do it. So we came up with a similar solution to this. What else has he got? Go back to the present and voting standard. Uh, we actually just explained that. A shift to three-fifths of the Senate present and voting would similarly require the minority to keep most of its members around when the Senate was in session. If, for example, the issue in question were voting rights, a Senate deliberating on the floor 24 hours a day for several days would put a sharp spotlight on the issue, forcing Republicans to publicly justify opposition to legislation aimed at protecting the voting rights of minorities. They might be perfectly happy to do that these days, but make them do it. Weekend Senate sessions would cause Republicans up for re-election in 2022 to remain in Washington instead of freeing them up to go home to campaign. In a three-fifths present and voting scenario, if only 80 senators showed up, only 48 votes would be necessary to get cloture. Add to that a requirement that at all times a member of the minority party would have to be on the floor actually debating, and the burden would be even greater while delivering what Manchin and Cinema say they want, more debate. Although what it would actually probably deliver is... Uh, Republicans on the floor reading the phone book or uh, in the olden days, even before the controversy, reading Dr. Seuss books. Now they would love to have the opportunity to read Dr. Seuss books, but it would highlight some of the absurdity of it all. Well, you say that you want to continue debating this measure, but you're not doing it. So you might be lying about what you're saying here. What else has he got in pocket here? Narrow the supermajority requirement. That would be helpful. Another option would be to follow in the direction of the 1975 reform, which reduced two-thirds to three-fifths. And further, you could now reduce the threshold to, say, 55 senators. Still a supermajority requirement, but a slimmer one. Democrats might have some ability to get five Republicans to support their desired outcomes on issues such as voting rights, universal background checks for gun purchases, or a path to citizenship for dreamers. A reduction to 55, if coupled with a present and voting standard, would establish even more balance between majority and minority. In a 50-50 Senate, and with the GOP strategy clearly being united opposition to almost all Democratic priorities, Biden and Majority Leader Chuck Schumer need the support of Manchin and Cinema on a daily basis. They won't be pressured by or persuaded by pressure campaigns from progressive groups or from members of Congress, but they might consider reforms that weaken the power of filibusters and give Democrats more leverage to enact their policies without pursuing the dead end of abolishing the rule altogether. So it's all entirely possible. Uh, the difficulty is uh, different. There's a, a different problem, which is that, uh, well, I mean, some of it might be solvable simply by... Uh, creating new precedent by upholding or in some cases strategically rejecting rulings from the chair about what the precedents actually say. But for the most part, like most of those things, as opposed to the straight up nuclear option of, I believe that cloture can and should be invoked by simple majority vote. 
and simply ruling it that way. Uh, most of this, the way, I think changing the way things are counted. Well, maybe not. I was going to say, in a, you know, in a more realistic world, I would say, um, and here, are like, this is like the parliamentarian making determinations about whether or not something fits under the bird rule. The more legalistic interpretation of things is, well, this would require a rules change, not simply a change in interpretation or setting a new precedent. Uh, changing the threshold from uh, two thirds to three fifths to 55 percent or 55 senators or however you would phrase it uh, would ordinarily, I think, require a rules change. But then again, thinking about what they did with the nuclear option in 2013, I mean, all they did, that, that should have required a rules change, too. They just said, well, uh, the way we'll do it is say, yeah, I know what the standing rules of the Senate say about invoking cloture. We just simply claim to interpret that differently. And that's kind of a fiction. So I suppose at that point you could just do the same fiction with these things. Yes, uh, the rules say three-fifths are required for cloture on now on legislation, three-fifths of those present and are uh, uh, duly chosen and sworn. You could, for instance, say, I actually find that to mean three-fifths of those present and voting. And people would say, that's crazy. It's in black and white. That's not what it says. And if you had 51 votes to say, uh, no, that is what it says. <laughs> that that would do the trick. Uh, you know, I find it somewhat distasteful, just as I found it a little bit distasteful in 2013. I always favored the approach of doing it on opening day of a new Congress so that it was more akin to saying, look, these will be the rules of this new Congress going forward, and everyone should understand what they're going to be before we begin work on any legislation. Uh, but OK, it didn't happen that way. So once it did happen the way it happened in 2013, I guess any of these things are really, truly possible. Anytime you put together 51 votes to simply say that's just what we believe it says, even though the words are pretty clear uh, that, they, that this is not what it means. But you could. So I guess you could do it. I mean, I don't love it, but you could do it. And uh, look, you know, uh, you might need to do these things to save your legislative priorities. And Norm has a point here. If you could convince Mansion and Cinema, look, the filibuster still exists and cloture still requires a supermajority of some kind. Uh, would that be enough to convince them? I, and I think on the right priority it just might if it if the bill matters to them enough that they wish they could eliminate the filibuster and would if they hadn't promised in so many words that they wouldn't well give them this excuse okay now you won't eliminate the filibuster you'll just change the way we do the counting on the voting and probably in all likelihood most people would not just wouldn't recognize the change especially i think the stealthiest one you could do is say all right well now it's going to still require three-fifths of the senate but we could do those present and voting rather than those duly chosen and sworn no one will understand that although uh you know they'll be able to understand well it used to take 60 and now it doesn't and you say well no the rule is that it takes three-fifths of the senate and three-fifths of a hundred is 60 but if 100 of them don't show up, then it's three-fifths of however many show up. And you just got to take out a calculator and look. Here's, here are the numbers. Uh, as it happens, uh, three-fifths, uh, what, the, the one scenario they said was if only 80 senators show up, 48 votes invoke cloture. Well, it doesn't make sense. I thought it was 60. Well, no, it actually was three-fifths. And you probably never get around to the point where you would, have to explain to people that the the standard had changed. Well, I used to, I think I thought it used to be sixty. You could probably get away with lying and saying, "Oh, it was never sixty. It was always just three fifths." But uh, they always showed up to vote on these things, and this time they didn't. And whose fault is that? Oh, 
you know. All right, so a little white lie you'd probably be able to get away with on that one. Okay, uh, good suggestions, and it's the only way I can see to work with Mansion and Cinema and uh, reconcile for them. The, the point is coming at which they will say, I absolutely have to have this thing pass, but I promised not to change filibuster rules. This is, I think, a pretty good solution. Uh, so keep it in pocket. We'll be right back. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, your host for KGRO in the Morning. I have good news to report. Many more listeners like you are making critical contributions that keep our show on the air. Makes good sense, of course, and Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, makes it simple. Now you can make easy, secure, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. Maybe you'd like to thank us for helping keep you sane during the Trump era. Maybe you're looking forward to in-depth explanations of what's going on in the Biden administration. Whatever it is that keeps you listening, we need your help to keep bringing it to you. And hey, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running with those options too. Thanks again, everyone, for all your support. We literally could not do this without you. All right, welcome back now to the Cake Growing the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Uh, let's uh, add to this discussion comment here via Twitter from Arliss Bunny. Good to hear from you again. Uh, she says, I have two words for Senator Wayback Machine Cinema, Lyndon Johnson. Uh, meaning that the Senate has never really been bipartisan. It's just that in the past they tended to do more of the leg breaking in the cloakroom. That's partially true, at least. Um, and uh, you know, I mean, some of the some of it comes from the fact that, well, there was a time, I suppose, when the Senate was slightly more bipartisan, in that uh, there were members of the of both parties who voted more frequently with the bulk of the opposite for the uh, the opposing party because they were just they were more ideologically aligned uh, there were uh, very conservative democrats who tended very often to vote with uh, with conservative republicans and there were also many more moderate uh, republicans of the northeast and new england mold though they didn't all come from the northeast and new england um and, and and that mold has been uh, long since abandoned. <laughs> they just don't exist anymore, even though some of them try to continue to wear the disguise. But there were moderate Republicans who very frequently voted with Democrats on a lot of things. And in the last, uh, just to take the example of filibuster reform from 1975, uh, there were Democrats and Republicans alike working for that that reform. Not something that you see anymore, uh, but it's also true that uh, a lot of the um, a lot of the mythology of the bipartisan days of the Senate was also just that. There was also, I mean, Lyndon Johnson, especially when he was in the presidency, had enormous majorities and enormous lots of things. But one <laughs> one of them we won't talk about. Uh, the other, though, was the majorities in the House and Senate. They were able to get a lot of things done. But but a lot of big, controversial bills that are apparently still controversial, like the Voting Rights Act, were passed without resort to having to invoke cloture and passed with less than 60 votes and never... Uh, it was just it was never assumed as a requirement that 60 votes needed to be amassed for that. And 60 wouldn't have helped anyway, because at the time, uh, 67 was the threshold for cloture anyway. So think about that. Right. Uh, a lot of these things passed uh, with considerable uh, support from among those, you know, well, certainly considerable support in the Senate, 55 plus votes, but the bulk of them were Democrats. There were a few Republican votes for it, but there was nowhere near 67. So, yeah, I mean, I think cinema just has this weird idea about what the Senate used to be like, and it's not true. And, you know, watching her who's been in the Senate, you know, the equivalent, considering the, the number of years many of the senators have spent there, of being there for about 15 minutes, and talking like a traditionalist. And I'm just trying to hold up the old 
standards of whatever. It doesn't really ring true for me. All right. Let's see. Oh, and speaking of um, uh, the traditionalism, that reminds me right at the beginning of Norman Warnstein's piece where he was talking about, or uh, I guess the tweets we were reading and setting it up about Joe Biden's position on the filibuster changing or not changing. Uh, I only, I, I actually pointed that out as a marker just to put this down. The 1975 rules change that, uh, that that saw the 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 cloture requirements go from two thirds to three fifths. Uh, Joe Biden was there for that. He was in the Senate. He was new, but he was in the Senate for those and voted for them. And uh, you know, so one of the it, it's interesting, of course. You know, he's now considered a Senate traditionalist because he spent so much time in the Senate and he's an institutionalist, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I guess he didn't really have to change his position on the filibuster since the. F- you know, one of the first things he did as a member of the Senate, but he joined the Senate that had a cloture rule set at two thirds and he happily joined in with the ranks, changing it to three fifths and did so by voting, I think twice in support of executing what became known eventually now in the modern setting as the nuclear option to do it. So yeah. Uh, and back in, uh, 2013, when he was vice president, uh, you know, under the direction of the White House, of course, as most vice presidents have to be, uh, he didn't come out and support changing the filibuster rules outright, even for just for nominations, uh, and uh, pretended like, you know, oh, well, we just want to work things out along uh, traditional lines, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm never for changing the rules this way, even though it had just it had been one of the first things he had done as a new member of the Senate. And he just figured everybody had forgotten about that or had never researched what his role was in the 1975 rules change. But uh, too bad I had done that. All right. So whatever. Uh, His position evolves. That's fine. Uh, I hold, I don't hold it against him, obviously. All right, let's see. A couple other things to get to. Uh, many of them will uh, become points of frustration and we'll have to spend time on the stories tomorrow instead. Uh, let me do this. Uh, I will take this opportunity to... to I will, you know, I'll take it as a short break. Darwin Darko has chimed in once again with a story from the uh, uh, the military end of the spectrum there's a a significant or a story of significance that came into focus uh in the aftermath of the january 6th insurrection when we found out uh well one that we, we knew that pence was being targeted by the rioters by the way he's out there uh telling the big election lie now trying to i guess ingratiate himself with Republican voters again in the hopes of keeping his political career alive. But he's out there boosting the lies about voter fraud that uh, his, uh, I guess when he was, when when push came to shove, he denied that these things were true. Or maybe he never denied that the lies were true uh, or that he thought that they were true. He just simply... uh, didn't agree with his ability to interfere in the uh, mechanical process of counting the electoral votes. Anyway, it caused the rioting mobs to call for his execution. Uh, And then, you know, he's escaped the noose, but is out there telling the same lies that caused people to want to hang him just a month or two ago. Mm, Whatever. Okay. I'm sure you'll get far. Uh, Anyway, um, it came to uh, be known that in escaping the Capitol that day, remember we saw the surveillance footage that indicated that he and his Secret Service detachment uh, also included a, uh, a, a an Air Force officer who was carrying the nuclear football. And uh, although we learned that it wouldn't have been possible for insurrectionists to get their hand on the football and therefore be able to launch a nuclear strike, it was still somewhat disconcerting. And it has given rise to uh, uh, consideration of 
the uh, idea that perhaps it might not be wise to leave planet-ending uh, n- nuclear weaponry potential in the hands of just one person, considering that we just went through four years of a president who was considered throughout most of his presidency and before and, of course, now after, as being too mentally unstable to be trusted with the quote-unquote nuclear button. So questions constantly arose. Can Trump really, would he be able to launch a nuclear attack all by himself without any uh, checks or balances along the way? And people came to differing conclusions. But one of the things that came up uh, along the way is, well, maybe we ought to restructure sole launch authority uh, as being, uh, restructure how it's vested in the president and and the president alone. Uh, ironically, one of the uh, one of the ironic upshots of having a total lunatic a hole in the presidency is that everybody knows that that should be revamped immediately, so that he's not left in charge of the in sole charge of the nuclear ar- uh, arsenal. But he's such a crazy, unpredictable a hole that no one dared bring it up for fear that I guess he would I don't know that he would nuke you I don't know what, what people thought he would do. But it's only when he is eventually replaced with a rational thinking human being that can be reasoned with that people start to say, well, now we should be limiting the president's uh, ability to launch unilaterally because we trust that he won't kill us or jail us or attack us in any way uh, for suggesting it. Though he may oppose it, he won't attack us personally or kill us or any of the other stupid things that an idiot like Donald Trump might be suspected of doing. So anyway, uh, now people are considering that. Again, ironic. And that comes up in the discussion. But let's let Darwin lead that discussion in his reading and commentary on this piece from Military.com. Dozens of House Democrats call on Biden to give up sole nuclear launch authority. Tell us about it. Thank you, Kegro. Hello to all the... Hashtag KITM Zeitgeist out there. Today I'm reading us a piece from military.com. This was from February 25th, uh, written by Steve Bannon. Not that Steve, I'm sure they're not related. But it's entitled, Dozens of House Democrats Call on Biden to Give Up Sole Nuclear Launch Authority. Nearly three dozen House Democrats are urging President Joe Biden to relinquish his sole authority to order a launch of nuclear weapons, arguing that No single person should wield apocalyptic military power. Vesting one person with this authority entails real risks, they go on to say. Past presidents have threatened to attack other countries with nuclear weapons or exhibited behavior that causes other officials to express concerns about the president's judgment. This was according to a letter written by uh, California Rep. Jimmy Pineda and Ted Lieu. The, The letter doesn't mention Trump directly, but Democrats frequently question his mental state. If you recall, of course, uh, still do personally, uh, questioning his mental state and his composure throughout the entire time that he was in the, the Oval Office. Trump often flouted the enormous power he had at his disposal. One time, um, you know, he was talking about Kim Jong Un and he, he was talking about how his button is, is, is much bigger than Kim's button. So cavalierly, uh, just basically n- making light of nuclear weapons, and, you know, the devastation that potentially could happen at the press of that button. I'll continue with the article here. So, Speaker of the House Pelosi, two days after a pro-Trump mob assaulted the Capitol on January 6th, that uh, she had spoken with Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley, about preventing an unstable president from launching nuclear weapons. The worry is not about Biden, but more about Trump or another future Trump-like president, said Stephen Young who advocates on the dangers of nuclear weapons for the Union of Concerned Scientists. No one person should have this ability to kill tens of hundreds of millions in less than an hour. It is simply too much power. The lawmaker's uh, letter argues that other officials, including the VP and Speaker of the House, should concur with the launch order before it can be issued. While any president would presumably consult with advisors before ordering a nuclear attack, they ain't know a person like Trump was going to be going to be out in these streets and being the commander in chief. Uh, the military is obligated to carry out the order 
uh, of the commander in chief as long as it's deemed to be a lawfully given order, right? Uh, so under the current posture of the U.S. nuclear forces, that's all that it takes. Uh, just the president say so, and uh, you have launch. So it goes on to say, but given up the ability to make a quick decision during an emergency, so playing the other side here, could have grave security consequences. Both the president and the vice president are always accompanied by a so-called football, which contains communications equipment needed to order a nuclear launch. If an adversary were to launch a strike against the U.S., the president would potentially have only minutes to make a decision and launch an attack, raising concerns over any additional bureaucracy during a time of crisis. I, I get that point. Uh, bureaucracy got us um, invaded on January 6th and, and prevented you know, uh, the protection of the Capitol when it came to getting the National Guard out there. So there is that is that's a good point. Uh, John Robinson, a retired Army chief, warrant officer, and former targeting officer who helped plan the use of nuclear weapons at the combatant command level, said having a nuclear football by committee could be devastating. How would that work? He says that uh, such a thing could mean that congressional leaders would need to have their own nuclear footballs. You could have as little as 20 minutes heads up. Say, for example, North Korea fired a weapon at Japan, um, which we have a treaty obligation you know, we be behind the uh, yay ball uh, and responding if we have to go through this this roll call here. So what would happen? Would it be, you know, majority win? Would it be, you know, it has to be unanimous? It's stuff like that would have to be would have to be figured out. And again, now, even as I'm speaking, that's been 45 seconds and we just lost Los Angeles. Potentially, that could be, you know, something that could, that could be a problem. That could be an issue in the future. Uh, he goes on to say, so what if one disagrees? Is this a majority vote? Whether they're right or wrong, you still have the, to wrestle with Article 2, Section 2 of the Constitution. There's nothing there that says anybody other than the commander-in-chief will have this level of responsibility. So I can see both sides of the issue here. I do have... um I, while I do agree it is a lot of power for one person, and I know a lot of stories from the past where, um, just by happenstance, you, you might be familiar with the story in the, the Soviets one time, uh, something was going on with their radar that detects, um, incoming, incoming attack. And it was just actually a malfunction in the system. And this one person that was sitting there in charge of, you know, the, a response, and this wasn't even at the, this was at the like uh, rank and file level. This person was monitoring this system. He made a call to not retaliate and thinking that this has got to be a, a mistake here, particularly because all the other contingencies they had in place were not, uh, the alarms weren't going off anywhere else, right? Uh, so it turns out he was right on that one, right? He was correct. It was an error. He didn't strike back, which in hindsight, it would have been like, we would have been like, okay, they struck first. So just to have one person to press one button and it's go time, that can be catastrophic. I get that. Uh, but at the same time, having this committee of, of folks having to decide on what move to make here, uh, and having to carry in another nuclear football, maybe it's, maybe it would be the VP and the Speaker of the House. But putting all that aside, here's where I have an issue. And I don't have answers for this, but here's my issue. Democrats are constantly disarming themselves. Unilateral disarmament. That's the term I'm looking for. The Republicans don't do that. If we, if we put this rule in place for Biden, as soon as Republicans come back in power, they're going to scrap this. They're going to scrap that plan. And Trump is going to have at his fingertip this power yet again. But we're going to disarm ourselves as Democrats without even, um, not even a proposal from the Republican side, we're doing it to ourselves. These are Democrats that wrote this letter to make this happen, disarming ourselves in all our powers. And this, this doesn't just happen in, um, in this military talk. We're talking about stuff that happens on the Hill too. So I don't have the answers, but maybe you can weigh in, David, and tell me what you think about the one-sidedness that Democrats tend to have once they're in power, where they, they limit themselves, where Republicans would never do such a thing. They just seize more and more power. So that's it for me today. Thanks for hearing me out. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Darwin underscore Darko. Back to you, David. All right. Well, uh, that is a tough one. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. Can I avail myself of the same 
position. I don't know if I have the answers. Uh, certainly not immediately. Um, it's it's a com it's a common problem and a constant problem. Uh, and uh, usually, when it's proposed uh, in any context, something like this, uh, Democrats saying, "Well, we would do this to we would willingly do this to ourselves, uh, so that." There wouldn't be the accusation of partisanship if we were, for instance, if Democrats were calling on uh, calling for a revision of policy like that while Trump was president. Republicans would say, oh, well, this is just a partisan motivation, although it would really be interesting to see that argument be made in the context of uh, of uh, reforming nuclear command and control like well you're just being partisan trying to prevent uh, a republican president from having this power well you know that might work if the power was uh, i don't know regulating uh, face masks through osha or you know any regular normal domestic policy as opposed to well the ability to destroy all life on the planet you know that's not really a partisan issue per se not that it would stop republicans from claiming that it was and from uh, rank and file Republicans from believing that it was. Uh, by the same token, I would say there's nothing about Democrats voting to limit the power of a Democratic president that would make Republicans uh, later, either as you as as Darwin pointed out, either not simply repeal those reforms when a Republican was back in charge. But certainly nothing about uh, the fairness of doing it to a Democratic president in the expectation that it would then stick for a Republican president that makes any sense there either. You know, uh, when Republicans are largely uh, gimmitarian about anything and everything, uh, it, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to, to, as you say, unilaterally disarm. But then again... Uh, this is a different kind of a uh, of a topic because it it involves the fate of the entire world as opposed to uh, unilateral disarmament on something of less much less consequence. Like for instance, what well, we keep going back to the blue slip uh, practice in the Senate Judiciary Committee. Much less at stake with the blue slips than nuclear annihilation, of course. But we used to see things like that all the time where Democrats would say, well, we'll take the high road and we'll do it to ourselves. We'll voluntarily hobble ourselves to set an example for how things ought to go. And, you know, in the simplified world where this sort of stuff makes sense, the Republicans would be too embarrassed not to live up to the challenge. But that never really works. So I don't know. Um but again, on the other hand, uh, you know, where the stakes are very high, uh, sometimes it pays to try to do the right thing and hope that uh, inertia or what or, or public pressure uh, on Republicans might actually work. You know, uh, where the stakes are nuclear annihilation or things like uh, helping Texas through their power crisis or, as others have suggested, in the last couple of days that if the governor was going to repeal the mask mandate in the face of all warnings to the contrary, then maybe uh, if Texas just wasn't serious about battling the pandemic after all, and we shouldn't send or waste any of our valuable vaccine on them down there since they seem to love the pandemic so much, which of course, in reality, ignores the fact that uh, many, many <laughs> Uh, worthy folks uh, who, in fact, if this interests you, are Democratic voters, for instance, or are vulnerable vulnerable populations victimized by Republican voters in Texas would be the ones to suffer for our vindictiveness. And you say, all right, ultimately, that's just not something that a responsible government can do. Similar decision making process when it comes to nuclear annihilation of all life on the planet. Well, maybe we ought to be the bigger people here and do the right thing, even if Republicans don't follow suit. I mean, I guess in the end, uh, nothing's changed. No loss on our part for limiting the ability to launch nuclear strikes for a democratic president, because it's our hope that no, no democratic president, no president at all would launch a nuclear strike. And 
Uh, if we get to the point where we actually have to resort to full on use of our nuclear arsenal, uh, politics would be the least of our problems at that point. So that's all I mean. It's not an answer, but it's things to think about. All right, let's see. Uh, a few more minutes to throw in a couple other issues. Plenty still to go with on Friday for more substantive investigations, but now we're we're time limited, uh, like reconciliation bills in the Senate. So we'll do a couple of small bore stories. I happened to notice this one yesterday as uh, one of our good Twitter friends, maybe one of your good Twitter friends too, J.C. Christian, General J.C. Christian, Patriot, you know him, uh, from Twitter, happened to be retweeting this piece along with the correct answer to the question posed here by Andrew Rose Gregory, uh, uh, with whom I am not familiar, but who observes the... Uh, photos circulated on who knows which social media platform by Donald Trump Jr. of uh, he uh, himself with, I guess, one of his kids. I don't recognize his kids, but I assume this is one of his kids and not one that he kidnapped or hired to pose with him. Uh, posing with a Dr. Seuss Cat in the Hat book. Uh, no commentary offered on the photos that are shown here. And I guess the whole thing is that they've owned the libs by reading one of the Dr. Seuss books that is not being taken out of print and is not part of the controversy. I don't know why that uh, is supposed to score points, but it's Donald Trump Jr. So, you know, a stupid thing was bound to happen no matter what, even though the reading material was easy, simple and easy to understand. Uh, he still didn't understand it. And uh, this is supposed to own us. He's posing with one of his kids with a cat in the hat book. But Andrew uh, observes here that Donald Trump is holding the book for the photo somewhat awkwardly. And it's a very interesting way. And you'll, I guess I'll circulate the picture for you to see if you didn't happen to see it. But he's holding the book. Um, not by the spine of the book, but by the opposite side, you know, the open side of the book, but not in the middle of the, the, the book, but down at the bottom. Basically what he's doing is he's holding the book such that he is covering what is the lower right hand corner of the cover. And you can see uh, that sticking out from underneath it is part of the design of the cover and the supposition I think is the correct one here. Andrew asks, is Donald Trump Jr. holding this copy of the cat in the hat uh, so weirdly because he felt the need to hide that he has what the what's revealed by the weird design down there is that he's holding the bilingual edition of the book. Uh, it's a weird hold, certainly. And if you take a look, you can see that starburst design down in the corner peeking out from behind his fingers, but the text underneath is not visible. Um, that does that starburst doesn't appear on the uh, English only, or I suppose the Spanish only version of the Cat in the Hat. But what it does appear on is somebody's got a picture of one of those books with the starburst. There it is. The uh, it's underneath the text is in English and Spanish. So, I mean, it's a fine thing to do and a great way to teach your kids a little bit of conversational Spanish by having it side by side. But of course, uh, MAGA America cannot tolerate the bilingualism. And so, uh, I don't know, somehow also billionaire's son couldn't run out and get another copy of the book that isn't in English and Spanish and then just take the picture with that. No, he's worked well. He's a thrifty guy. So there you go. I uh, just thought I would share that with you, and that probably took longer than I thought it was going to just to get that word out. But uh, what can you do? He's a weird guy, and I wanted you to know about it. All right, one other thing that I'll throw in here as we make our exit from the show from the day, an observation from Daniel Schumann uh, of Demand Progress, taking note of the Punchbowl News report 
that, as he put it, the Senate Republicans are socializing, that is circulating, the idea that they will now never allow a regular appropriations bill to pass while the Democrats are in charge in the Senate. Only continuing resolutions to fund the government. That is to say they will avoid the embarrassment of having government shutdowns to the extent possible, but no regular appropriations bills, which are, of course, a major policy-making vehicle that they intend to take away from Democrats uh, during the entirety of the next two years. Pretty amazing, and he has a screen grab of the Punchbowl News newsletter that lays it out to prove it. Just something to keep an eye on. Another obstruction technique, and another one that will strain the ability of uh, all senators to get their work done, and the ability of, I think, probably Mansion and Cinema to continue to refuse to do anything, even small bore reforms of the filibuster and cloture rules along the way. So that's something to keep an eye on, something to keep an ear on, of course, to see what's coming next. The West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Justice Putnam. From NetworksRadio.com You have been listening to KGRO in the morning with David Waldman. All right, and aside from having an eye on events at the Capitol, we've got, uh, let's see, South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem's family got a $600,000 payday in federal virus grant money meant for small businesses. Another of the amazing uh, abuses we can look into in her handling of the 